Okay, we're good to go. All right, great. Uh, um, I will call this virtual meeting of the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council uh, to order. It is March 12th at eight o'clock. Uh, the meeting's being held in accordance with a memo dated April 21st, 2020 from the LCC chair and vice chair regarding commission meetings being held remotely. You may have already seen or heard these procedures. However, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with them, members should be muted when not speaking, use raised hand feature if you wish to speak and click lower hand when finished speaking. Uh, and we will use a roll call vote for everything except approving the agenda in the minutes. Um, and hopefully you've all been able to access the materials on the website. So that's what I officially have to say, but you know, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, we have two new members today, uh, Dudley Edmondson uh, and uh, Representative Heinzman. Uh, welcome to you both. Uh, glad to have you with us. Uh, look forward to working with you. Um, so the first thing on our agenda is uh, to review and approve the agenda. Um, can I get a motion to do that? I'll make a motion sure. All right. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next is to review and approve the minutes of our last meeting. Uh, can I get a motion to do that? I'll move the minutes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any discussion, corrections? All in favor, signify by saying aye or aye. thumbs up. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I would like to just ask anyone if, if they have any conflicts of interest uh, that they'd like to report uh, related to today's agenda. All right, seeing none there, uh, we'll just move forward. So I don't have a lot of comments for, oh, Jamie. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to note for the record and for the public that um, those of us in the legislature, it is the first deadline today. So I know I will not be able to be here for most of the meeting and I'm guessing the others will have to bounce around as well. So just wanted to note that. Great, thanks for letting us know. Um, it is always a risk to have these meetings during the legislative session. Um, in terms of my comments, uh, um, I'd first say, you know, thankfully Joe is, is on the call. Uh, he had an ugly bout with COVID, uh, was in the hospital for a while and is recovering now. Joe, we're glad to have you back. Um, sorry we didn't know you were gone. <laughs> but uh, you were pretty quiet there for a while. Um, the only other thing that I would really bring up, we're gonna talk about um, uh, extensions for COVID related uh, things uh, uh, that have come up for various project managers. Uh, uh, Mark just told me that there is one not on the list that uh, uh, hopefully we'll have a verbal report on before we uh, get to that part of the agenda or when we get to that part of agenda because we really don't want to hold people up from spending money. Uh, but the other thing I want us to consider when we get to that agenda item is whether or not we should just do a blanket one year extension for COVID related deals as a recommendation to the legislature instead of going through project by project. Uh, um, since we're not likely to say no, you know, because of COVID, you couldn't get your work done. So you're, you don't have the money anymore. Um, at least we haven't in the past. So that'll be something I, I hope we'll discuss when we get to that. Um, and unless there are questions for your chair, uh, um, the only other thing I would add is uh, the governor has not made his appointment. So we won't be doing item six, which is election of officers. Um, so if there are no questions or comments, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see all your smiling faces and, uh, 
love love getting together with you again. Um, sorry I wasn't here last time, but that was my turn to be sick, and Joe took over. So today I'm doing Joe's duties besides uh, give him a, a vocal break at least. The um, a couple of things I, I have a few things on my um, report to provide you. First of all, uh, I want to report some conveyances, some minor conveyances to you. Um, there are there are products in the upload in materials for you that you can look at to get all the details for them. But in a nutshell, um, what we have is first of all, Circle Lake WMA is um, out in uh, Big Stone County. I forget which county it is. It might be Big Stone. At any, it's Rice County. I'm sorry. And uh, they have the DNR has uh, found out that they have a 0.22 acre um, overlap with an adjoining okay. land landowner and actually that that adjoining landowner is the original parcel original homestead of that property um, so the dnr says the best fix that they feel the cheapest fix the best fix and from a um, neighborly standpoint as well as community standpoint and and the pro the habitat standpoint is just to sell that 0.22 acres to the landowner and everybody will be happy um, in looking over the materials, I, I agreed and um, seems like a minor conveyance. So that has been um, uh, the uh, legislative leadership has been appraised of it and barring any objection from leadership by the 22nd of March, uh, approval will be provided for that. There are also two minor requests that the DNR put in for the Blandon properties up in Northern Itasca County. The first was a a DOT easement for a roadwork easement. Actually, it was approved. Uh, it was a five and a half acre parcel or, or portion of property along the, along the highway. But um, it was approved by the council back at our June meeting for easement um, conveyance. But what really DOT wants is a fee conveyance. Conveyance. So because that paperwork has to be redone and because it, it, it needs official approval. So I have alerted the leadership to that. And again, March 26th, I think, is the, the deadline for any objections from leadership before approval will be provided for it to be a fee instead of an easement uh, conveyance. And the last is Itasca County on Highway 52 up in Northern Itasca County is doing some road improvements. And there's a 0.36 acres of permanent road easement uh, that'll be con a conveyance. Um, and uh, the same situation with that as far as uh, notifying leadership and everything. Um, based on our procedures as a council, um, it says that minor conveyances in, uh, um, can be approved by the executive director on behalf of the council. So that's for the new members, especially that's why this procedure goes, goes forward. And then I report those to you all. Um, the, uh, another report that I need to provide you is in statute, it says anytime there's a condemnation procedure um, with regards to outdoor heritage fund lands that, that has to be reported to the council. It also gets reported to, legisl to legislative leadership. Um, and we did get, actually we were, um, we got notification from the AG's office of a, um, uh, a parcel out in Big Stone County that was acquired by Pheasants Forever It'll, to eventually be turned over as, as part of a WMA. But there's a three and a half acre problem with it in that the county wants to do road improvements and uh, they need to widen from a safety standpoint that property. The uh, evidently somebody move fairly fast and maybe jump the gun, but at any rate, the AG then provided the, the paperwork and the, we were um, served as a claimant of interest on this because outdoor heritage funds were uh, provided in the appropriation to purchase the property. PFs or Pheasants Forever still owns the property and they've been speaking with the county and the county says, we don't wanna go through the condemnation. All we want is an easement so we can work on that road. Um, so um, the county and PF are working on this. The county says they'll, they're working on the paperwork for the easement and then the condemnation proceedings will be dropped. So I'm just waiting for the final details on that and then I'll be informing the, uh, the legislative leadership because um, it's kind of convoluted right now. But I had to report that to you. So that's, that's the reason for this. 
Um, we have some other reports, the status reports update. I'll let Sandy take that and because she provides you some wonderful materials with that. Okay, just for yes, brevity here, I'll just go over things quickly. Um, as members know, twice a year, managers submit uh, status updates to staff showing spending to date and accomplishments. And um, I provided three spreadsheets for you. The first one with the yellow columns is sort of an appropriation order of uh, open appropriations. Um, the second spreadsheet shows uh, programs grouped together and you can see that the yellow uh, highlighted rows are programs that are complete. And then you can see balances left and acres accomplished in the white uh, rows, not highlighted rows. Um, and one thing that came up at the past meeting with all the COVID extensions was, are we creating a backlog of money that's kind of sitting out there? So I put together a different type of analysis on the program spending by appropriation year. And, you know, you can see that the older appropriations, you know, it's one or two programs that are kind of still hanging out there. But um, the expectation of spending to date from Minnesota Laws of 17 forward is on track, you know, considering that programs are open for um, two years to find parcels to acquire, uh, additional five years to restore the acquired parcels and restoration enhancement programs are given five years total time. So we would not be expecting a lot of the most recent programs to have closed anyway. But as always, if members have questions about projects, programs, um, feel free to reach out to me via email. I'm happy to set up a time to talk and also project managers love to talk about the work they're doing on the ground too. So with that, I'll stand for questions if anyone has any. Any questions for Sandy? Otherwise, I'll just continue on with the report. All right, um, Mr. Chair and members, the uh, next thing I had, I've got two more things here. Um, the uh, next one was really talking about the bill and kind of looking at the progress. We have been moving in the House. We haven't been moving in the Senate yet, but we are scheduled to be in Senate Legacy next Wednesday. We just got that word last night. Um, so, and since we still have Beck, uh, Representative Becker Finn here right now, um, perhaps she wants to say a couple words about the bill as she feels it's going in the in the house. Uh, thank you. Thank her for her authorship there. Representative? Was was waiting for the chair to recognize me. Sorry, I'm in, in uh, legis legislative committee mode. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're a little more strict uh, in the right. legislature. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, so we uh, had a good hearing in uh, moved out of the Environment Committee and then are now laid over uh, in the Legacy Committee, which Chair, Chair Lilly is the chair of that committee. Um, we did have some, uh, we did have an amendment uh, to clear up some technical language and then uh, post February forecast um, topped off the CPL ask and then also um, appropriated some money to uh, No Child Left Inside type program focused on um, practical implementation and uh, training and education of folks. Um, and I think, you know, I think the other important thing to, to note for members is that, um, you know, there really has been a focus in the legislature this year in uh, on diversity and inclusion and um, address, addressing some of the disparities in um, who benefits from, from our legacy funds. And so there was, there was a push for members of the legacy committee uh, to get more creative and figure out a way that the outdoor heritage funds um, can, can reach a, a larger, larger number of people in our, in our communities. And so um, that's, uh, that's, that's the update. Uh, I haven't, you know, we've, we've met deadlines. So now uh, it'll be up to Chair Lilly uh, and then working with the Senate um, to move forward from there. All right. And Mr. Chair, I'll just jump right back in if that's okay. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. The, um, uh, Let's see, the other thing that I had for, uh, the last thing I have in my report for you is that just to mention to the council that we have an opportunity, uh, we, have a, we have a backlog of information that gets transferred from our website, the Outdoor Heritage website to the legacy website that's held by LCC. Um, there's 
automatic information that transfers to that, but then there's also gotta be a manual transfer of some other details that are smaller things. And that backlog because of COVID and because of, but mostly because of just transitions in staff is about two years old. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, unindating by any means, but it really needs to be cleaned up. So we have an opportunity here in early May to hire a, an, a previous employee of LCC who is, uh, influ who is very fluent in that area and knows exactly what to do. So we're going to uh, get that taken care of and it'll be about 20 hours or something that we have to hire this, this temp for. Um, but it's a good opportunity, the right person for the right job. So we're gonna make that happen and get it cleaned up. And Mr. Chair, that's, I believe what I have right now. All right. Are there any questions for Mark? Um, I, I'd like to ask Jamie how the, the No Child Left Inside program, which I'm a huge supporter of, uh, um, which we turned down as a, an appropriation recommendation in December, got back on the agenda, um, given our, our vote not to include it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and as I noted, um, there were some real concerns um, with the lack of diversity and uh, how funds have been spent up to this point and um, which which folks are benefiting from the dollars. And so um, at a, a kind of a, a rough hearing uh, at one point uh, earlier this session, um, trying to uh, put into words how we're how we're reaching out to those folks, um, and I guess I I didn't give the I didn't have the impression from uh, previous meetings that it was uh, that folks weren't uh, fans of that program but were choosing to to spend it otherwise. Of course, we didn't have time to meet uh, before the bill was up for a hearing, and uh, other members of the legacy committee were asking me what could be done um, with the additional funds that were available post February forecast. So, um, you know, made, made the, made the call that, uh, this was a good, uh, creative way to reach more people in our communities and, uh, um, pass the, passed out of the committee. So, um, I will say that, uh, we maintained the 10%, uh, reserve instead of the 5% reserve that is, um, that is used by some of the, the councils. So, uh, that's, that's, that's the update. Okay. Josh, you have your hand up. You're on mute, unfortunately. I think I'm back. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the minority lead on the committee, I would like to at least mention the Environment Committee specifically that uh, Representative J.B. Becker Finn was referring to. Uh, I should mention that it was not uh, unanimously supported that there was definitely uh, a difference of opinion, and uh, my caucus supported the recommendations as you pass them out. Great, thank you. Uh, I have two Jamies with their hands up. Uh, Jamie Swenson, can we go to you first? Sure, I can't find the uh, raise hand button anymore, so I hope that was okay. You um, raised your hand, I saw it. Yep, um, I, if my recollection is correct, I know we had the, the conversation about this at the last meeting, and I'm Regardless of, of, of the topic and, and, the, and what the program is for, I, I am disappointed in the proposed amendment, both in the precedent that it would set and also the unconstitutional deviation of, of that recommended council allocation. It's, if, if that's a program that we want to be spending money on, I'd like to see it come through the, the channels that the, this council um, has already established and, and so that it can be, be brought through the proper, the proper way. Okay. Thank you. Now, Jamie Becker Finn. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I guess I'm uh, a little disappointed um, that that folks are not um, not open to this. You know, I think uh, we are in a really critical point right now where um, we're we're being asked at the legislature to to get more creative. We had a select committee on racial justice over the interim and. Um, are really putting in efforts to make sure that every every dollar that we spend um, and that we appropriate as a legislative legislature, um, that we are looking at equity and we are looking at ways that we can do better. And I, mm -hmm. um, as I 
uh, when I presented the bill in the legacy committee, as I, I made clear, you know, it's not to say that the work that's been done up to this point is bad. It's just saying that we could do better. And, um, you know, when I, I know it's hard for non legislators, but, you know, when you're under the gun and a bill is up in committee and that's sort of your time frame to get um, an amendment in, uh, you know, you don't you have to move quickly. And I think um, as to uh, the assertion that this bill, that the language would be unconstitutional, that has not been what I have heard from our House research. That is not my reading as an attorney. Um, that that is the case. Um, and I, I didn't know I was gonna be put on the spot, so I don't have the language right in front of me, but um, just pulling it up here so that I can I can read it so that you can- um, It says provide training and education is the, is the main thing that I'm looking at right here. So um, Mr. Chair, uh, so is the assertion that um, training folks to do practical implementation of protecting, restoring and enhancing habitat would be unconstitutional because I think um, I'm, I'm pretty troubled by that, especially when we've been tasked as a council to look at, um, to be creative. Um, you know, I think that's actually in statute um, that we're supposed to have a, a wide variety of things that we're, we're attempting to do. So, um, you know, it's, we've spent one point, it's, it's 2% of the overall bill um, that is currently allocated to that purpose. And uh, I believe when I did the math, my calculator had trouble, but it was a 0.0002% of the overall $1.2 billion that have already been appropriated. So, um, you know, trying something different with 0.0002%, I, you know, seemed like the kind of thing that um, my values dictate would be uh, uh, something we should be giving a shot. Ron? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have to echo Jamie's comments too, uh, Swenson's comments. Um, you know, that is a, uh, uh, No Child Left Inside is a wonderful program, um, but so is creating habitat, preserving, protecting habitat in this state also, perhaps even a greater program. And um, so I think this is a misuse of the money, you can talk about the constitution. I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what I do know is that when this was, when this was sold to the people of Minnesota, this was sold as increasing your sales tax to protect, uh, develop, restore fish and wildlife habitat. It was that simple. And it wasn't anything else about helping kids get outdoors, et cetera. As far as I know, all of our public areas are open to kids of any stripe. So to now divert some of those funds, even though it might be just a little bit, is uh, I think um, not following the spirit of that legislation and what people in Minnesota expected their sales tax money to be, to be used for. To me, it's that simple. I also think there are other ways we could fund uh, uh, the, the children's programs. General revenue is one. Um, and there are others, the lottery, for, exa for example. But I think we have to leave the fish and wildlife habitat incentives alone. Because if we don't, it's a slippery slope. The next thing you know, somebody else is going to come along and say, hey, this is a great cause. Uh, we, uh, we have to do this. And there we go. So that's my, my two cents. And I I strongly oppose uh, what's going on here, especially since the entire council uh, was not even asked about this or voted for it. In fact, voted it down. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, did you call me? I did. Oh, okay. I got you cut out for a sec there. Um, thanks, I, I appreciate this uh, discussion and, uh, and conversation and I absolutely think that the council um, should vigorously uh, defend um, its process and the dollars um, that has been tasked to oversee and advise and make recommendations on. Um, but I also want to say at the same time that the legislature um, helps itself to uh, redirecting um, and, and 
changing um, the recommendations of all of the other uh, commissions um, that bring forward uh, a similar body of work, you know, whether that's you know, the uh, parks and trails, uh, clean water, LCCMR, you know, so when I hear um, righteous speeches from other legislators about not touching a hair on the head of Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Commission yet, then, uh, you know, help themselves to uh, taking money and putting it into, um, you know, you know, clean water infrastructure out of LCCMR or or supplanting um, our bonding bill by bonding against, you know, some of those sources. You know, I, you know, I just, I just asked for some consistency, and I asked for this body to show up on behalf of those entities as well, because, um, you know, for whatever reason, Lassard Sam's has been, you know, the kind of the holy grail. I think it's because Dennis Anderson writes uh, very angry columns whenever one penny is moved out of Lassard Sam's, but everyone's perfectly, you know, happy to see all kinds of supplanting going on across LCCMR, the arts, um, parks and trails, you know, all the other legacy funds too. So, um, and I'll just say, you know, for the record, it is the right of the, of the legislature to do that. We are the ones who are elected and democratically accountable for how dollars are spent. Um, so, you know, and, you know, I respect this process and I will fight it and defend it and uphold it as well. Um, but I'm just looking for some, A, consistency across all the funds and for the voices on this council to show up on behalf of those as well, because, you know, that's, that's the proverbial slippery slope. If we think it's so important that the recommendations be kept whole as they go forward to the legislature and not one word and one dime be moved, um, you know, there, there, there needs to be no double standards here. Sorry, Jamie and then Ashley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'm actually curious of if anyone actually read the amendment um, to 634 because it's it's setting up essentially, we're using the No Child Left Inside grant program as the overseer because the DNR has already showed how they can be successful in reaching a more diverse uh, uh more diverse applications. They've they've been successful in doing small grant programs. Um, when I was working with Representative Zhang and Representative Hassan um, on this language, um, you know, we imagined this as a, a CPL type program. You know, it's a small grant program um, because it allows you to reach more people. Um, and I, I do want to clarify that it's to provide training and education to youth in the practical implementation of conservation practices, sorry, missing committee, um, practical implementation of conservation practices that protect, restore, and enhance wetlands, prairies, forests, and habitat for fish, game, and wildlife. So it's it's still meeting the 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 what the Constitution tasks us to do. And um, frankly, I don't think when the public voted in favor of this that they thought that it, I don't think that anyone at that point um, if we meant protect to mean acquire, then it should have been drafted that way. I think the courts would interpret it that way, that um, protect has to mean more than just acquiring land. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm really, uh, really just disappointed um, that there's uh, this much, uh, I guess, vitriol in uh, trying to do something that really, sh we probably should have been thinking about ways to do this uh, earlier, ways to, to reach more people. And I don't understand um, why it's fine to give millions and millions of dollars to different um, NGOs in the practical implementation of conservation practices, but somehow it's incredibly problematic for us to teach young people how to do those same practices. Uh, you know, we this is really a great opportunity here. And we, we do a lot of discussion in the legislature about how we grow the, the next generation of, of folks who care about our outdoor legacy. And I think this is uh, an incredible opportunity to do that. Um, I will say as well, there's, there's no supplanting here. This is not something that otherwise would be funded. Um, and, and to what Senator Dibble mentioned, you know, the, the statute and the constitution is that the the legislature allocates the funds. I don't think, um, you know, if the idea was that the council 
recommendations uh, could in any of these councils could could never be touched. We would have just had, you know, the the drafters of the law would have just had the the council have final say. And the the reality is that um, as Senator D Senator Dibble mentioned. Um, that it's a lot of money and it's money that belongs to all Minnesotans. And ultimately, you know, it, it is the legislature that are the ones uh, elected uh, to represent folks uh, throughout the state. And so, um, you know, I, I think uh, again, a 2% um, overall of the bill to try to do something more creative when um, we're being pressured to have these funds reach more people is, is a, a totally reasonable ask and um, you know, have gotten a lot of good feedback from the public already uh, about this, this idea. And so just uh, had no idea that um, folks would be so resistant to something um, so creative that would help us reach more Minnesotans who are already paying this sales tax. Ashley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Becker Finn, for um, bringing this forward. I mean, we we certainly need to be reaching out and um, helping folks understand how this um, how this funding is um, is relevant to all Minnesotans. Um, a number of organizations that use um, the outdoor heritage funds um, typically go through Conservation Corps to implement a lot of the, the different projects. Um, I'm curious if there was consideration in, in that conversation about how we reach the next generation, if, if there was a conversation around how that is already being done through the Conservation Corps, um, which from what I understand does train youth and young adults in the implementation of um, various conservation practices. Um, and a number of the organizations are already um, going through the Conservation Corps, um, but in a way that is somewhat more consistent with how um, the, the constitutional language has been interpreted previously. Um, I don't think anybody is against training youth um, and you know, including young adults in conservation of our natural resources. Um, I just want to go on record and say it, it is worth a conversation about how we ensure that this is constitutional and that we're not putting ourselves in a position where we could potentially be open to other things that we certainly aren't as big of fans of. So um, just hoping you can address some of the things that are already being done and how, how that came into the conversation. Great. Uh, Josh? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, could I respond so I don't forget what Ashley just asked? Uh, okay. I uh, thank thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, you know I'm fully aware of the Conservation Corps, but it's it's overwhelmingly I know when I've met with them I'm I'm a for, I'm a former AmeriCorps member myself, so um, big supporter of theirs. But I will tell you that it is mostly uh, uh, white young people who are benefiting from that program and. And I think, um, unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, when we had, we had a full day in legacy committee about how the individual councils and funds were addressing diversity. And unfortunately, the response for the Outdoor Heritage Council was um, really lacking. You know, the, and, you know, I'm not saying that, again, it's not saying that any of the work that's been done up to this point isn't good, but we, we must do better. And it, it simply isn't enough to say, oh, well, it's public land. It's open to everybody. Because we all know that that doesn't mean access for many people. And um, frankly, for I'm sure that the NGOs and the other folks who are watching who have, um, uh, who have received funding, millions of dollars of funding up to this point, um, you know, I, I think some of the resistance is because, uh, you know, if we if we spend it on something else, then that's less for me. And I think we've we've got to address that head on. And I would hope that, you know, wouldn't it be great actually if Pheasants Forever or Ducks Unlimited applied for one of these grants 
and trained young people in the things that they're already good at. And then also um, that's an entree into becoming future pheasant hunters or future duck hunters. You know, um, if uh, MACERC uh, with our outdoor uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, um, they could expand their programs uh, to train young people in um, the, you know, invasive species work that they do, the bee lab, uh, you know, lawns to legumes type programs, um, really the, the tree school, um, the opportunities are really endless um, if we, we open it up. And also I will say the No Child Left Inside program that the DNR has done an excellent job of making that application simple and understandable and getting it in different languages and really truly making it accessible to everybody in Minnesota and not just those who have grant writers and the ability to fill out very long, complicated um, things. And I think the other thing is when you have sort of the same 15 groups getting money for a decade, um, it sort of sends the message. And I think that folks uh, don't always uh, think that, that these funds are supposed to be for them. These funds don't belong to any of us on this council. They don't belong to any of the groups that get the funding. These are dollars that belong to every single Minnesotan. And um, I, I guess I, I challenge challenge you to to open up everybody to open up their thinking a little bit more and figure out how we we do serve more Minnesotans with this fund because right now um, we could be doing a lot better and I'm really sorry Mr. Chair but I'm going to have to hop over to Environment Committee very soon so I don't um, miss anything there. Josh. Thank you Mr. Chair and, and my comments are more directed towards Representative Becker Finn uh, the committee may benefit from what I what I say, so I am going to go ahead and, and uh, respond. Um, as as many of you know, I have carried the LCCMR bill, and as was uh, mentioned by a number of other members of this committee, uh, the precedent here is somewhat different than in other subject areas. The LCCMR has been changed many times, and I've been a part of changing that myself. That has been the precedent. And what we're talking about today, Representative Becker, and isn't the merits of your proposal. I've been around the legislature long enough to know this is your bill that you've been pushing and working on uh, nobly for quite some time. The issue that the members are uh, concerned about and what I hear them saying is the, this particular fund uh, has traditionally been uh, hands off. The legislature has done very little to use the funds in any other way other than that what was recommended. Now, I may agree or disagree with that, um, but as I'm listening, I feel that trying to attach some kind of uh, uh, concern from the committee, uh, from the commission to the actual merits of what is in the language that was brought forward, no, no child left behind, doesn't appear to be the issue. And as uh, a member of the legislature that very well may likely carry this particular bill in the future, uh, if the precedent, precedent is there to make changes at the legislative level, um, that will happen again. Um, not necessarily, uh, anybody making any kind of a, a threat, myself included, uh, but that is just the pattern that the legislature typically follows. And so, you know, I don't think it's, it's fair to impugn the members of this, this group uh, relative to the content of the actual proposal. It, it's a separate issue from what I can tell. And if somebody uh, would like to correct me or set the record straight, I'd be happy to uh, hear their comments. Mark, have you been trying to get my attention by waving? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I've got several points and I don't really want to. I got a, I got a lot of history in and around this conversation. Um, being a former member, chair of the Environment Finance Committee, member of LCMR, 10-year uh, working relationship inside the inside the legislature, I, I speak from a different point of view than some of the other members do. 
uh, <clears throat> but also as, as my eight years of leadership in the Department of Natural Resources, working with the legislature, I've been involved in what Senator Dibble referred to and some of the other members have talked about. And, and yes, the legislature is the ultimate authority and they're going to do with what they want. Um, to that point, I want to I want to stress to the legislative members. Um, I don't remember all the different things that we did or engaged in in my 10 years, but I can't tell you that I'm proud of all those things that that happened. Um, when I see this happening, I understand intimately what's going on behind the scenes and it doesn't really matter how you try to package it or how you try to say it. I see it and I know it for what it is. And that's fine. I, I, I just don't, I don't wanna soft pedal around this issue and, and, and pretend it's not what it is. This is an agenda item and I get that. And I'm not speaking against the proposal because I don't really know anything about this organization. Um, I get what they do from members' conversations. I also personally understand the benefit of what you're talking about. I have spoken publicly at symposiums about outdoor education with youth and the necessity for our education system to embrace and encourage that. So I, I'm, I'm well-spoken about that and, and agree with the principles of that. But I will tell you members, if like LCMR and other commissions, once you break it, once you break the integrity of it, once you devalue what this commission, the work that they do, you, it, it, it takes, if the effort it takes to regain its stature, regain its, um, you know, say prominence, or I'm not, I'm not, it's not authority in terms of we're the authority, it's the authority of the legislature created us for the purpose of guiding them in making decisions, to hash out, have these conversations, talk about what fish and wildlife habitat is or isn't, and how to best put that out onto the landscape. Our servicing of the public with these funds, as I understood it to be when I was the author of this back in the early 2000s and working with the nonprofit organizations over the years around these funds, this is about habitat. This is about preserving places. Yes, for people to go, but more to make sure that we have a quality habitat for species and to, to propagate for species to prosper out on that landscape. Um, the secondary benefit of me being able to go see it is secondary, it's not primary. And I, I hope the council understands that. Um, this is about making sure places can continue to support species on our landscapes, primary. And I just, I, I'm disturbed by some of the rhetoric being used here. Um, I'm disappointed by some of the rhetoric because I hear constantly from every member of their support for this concept. What we're really talking about though in our, in our concern is process and appropriate funding sources. And I can go on and on and on about proper funding sources. As we talk about my work within the Game and Fish Fund and trying to preserve and protect the dedicated funding streams and, and managing the funding streams for each and every little piece of funding stream that goes into the agency and make sure that those dollars get used appropriately to and from their source. This is that, that's what this debate really is. It's not about so much the merits of the proposal. 
It's really about the proper funding source for that and the institution of the Lassard Sams Commission and its authority to guide the legislature and have these debates. That's it. All right. Uh, Dudley? You're on mute. There you go. No? It's supposed to be a space bar, it didn't work. Sorry. Um, you know, I'm 100% in favor of no child left inside programming. And I understand what Representative Becker Finn is, is trying to do uh, because it makes sense that so much of conservation money does tend to benefit mostly rural white people or uh, privileged white youth in, in urban space or in, you know, around the state. But at the same time, I feel like um, our mission here is in my mind, extremely crystal clear. The dollars are, should never be spent on human beings. The dollars are supposed to be spent on habitat, habitat conservation protection only. And that to me is super, super clear, super obvious, easy. I've looked at it a number of times and that's just kind of how I feel about it. There's, I mean, even if we're giving dollars to organizations, we're not giving dollars to people, we're giving dollars to conservation, we're giving dollars to forests, we're giving dollars to prairies, we're giving dollars to um, water, uh, you know, preservation, uh, you know, wetlands, et cetera, et cetera. And that to me is a super crystal clear message. And I just think that any deviation from that is is a bad idea. Um, and and I, I mean, I go on, record for saying that. I mean, I'm a hardcore conservationist, have been my entire life. And I always put environment first uh, ahead of people because um, without environment, there are no people. Um, and that's just the way I've always looked at it. Uh, and I have an easy time taking people out of the equation when it comes to habitat protection, preserving wildlife, preserving um, things is just the people benefit from having the, the healthy environment, but like Mark said, they're not priority, they're secondary. And that sounds probably sounds horrible, but that's just the way I feel about it. There is no, there is no anything for humans without, without a healthy ecosystem. And without a healthy ecosystem, we've got nothing. And so to me, I'm hoping there's there's money somewhere else for these kinds of programs because I'm obviously that's part of what I do as a public speaker. I talk about diversity and inclusion, diversity in the out of doors, um, trying to get more people of color into the out of doors uh, because I think it's extremely important to the future of conservation in America uh, for the next four decades. The vast majority of the growth of the American population will be youth of color. That is unchangeable as far as I can tell. Uh, so doing things and having programming around uh, educating youth uh, about the environment uh, is extremely important because those are the people who are gonna be the stewards of the land. But at the same time, the dollars that are in these funds are not to be used that way. And that's just the way I, 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 I mean, it sounds, I don't know why every time I say it, it sounds terrible, but, but I just feel like that it's a no-go. That these dollars are supposed to be for habitat, habitat only. And if people in rural Minnesota are the vast majority of the beneficiaries of that, then yes, we need to figure out how to do a better job of, of making uh, some of these dollars work in urban areas uh, but again, habitat first and people secondary for these funds. And I, I guess that's probably all I should say. All right. uh, Jamie, I, Jamie Becker, Finn, back to you and then Jamie and then Scott. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, to respond to a couple different things, this is about habitat. 
And millions of dollars of the 1.2 billion that have already been spent from these funds have paid for FTEs, have paid for employees, have paid for people to do work. And I guess what, I, I'm actually curious how many of you actually read the A3 amendment versus are just going off what you assume you already know about um, the DNR No Child Left Inside program. Um, as I said, it's, it's different language here. And, um, you know, maybe if, uh, if this had been on the agenda, I didn't, I didn't frankly uh, assume that this was going to be uh, an hour long discussion at the beginning of the agenda. Um, you know, and to be honest, I, there was no, um, there was no public testimony in opposition to this amendment. I didn't hear from anybody opposed to this at all. Um, and um, it's, it's puzzling to me that we're fine with the funds paying the wages and paying for people to do the work, um, but we're not okay with using the funds to train people to do the work. Um, and to, they'd still be doing it. Um, you know, they'd be doing it as volunteers. The work would still be happening. And that's why I'm, I'm really um, wondering how many of you actually read the A3 amendment from the legacy committee and what it says, because it's practical implementation of conservation practices that protect and restore and enhance habitat. That's exactly what it's doing. The only difference is that um, it's kids not being paid who are you know, young people who are doing the work instead of an employee of an NGO. And, um, you know, in the comment about, um, you know, traditionally these funds have been hands off. Well, traditionally this space and these funds have been hands off to BIPOC communities. And I will tell you as the first and only indigenous person to serve on this council, it is my job as an indigenous woman who cares about habitat and cares about what we're doing to challenge you to do better in this space. This is the reason that I am here. This is the reason that I do this work. And I, I, that's not rhetoric. That is um, coming from my heart and what I am, I am tasked to do. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm very used to other people telling me, oh, I really respect what you're trying to do, but, and there's always going to be a but. There is always gonna be a reason to not move from the status quo. And the reality is that um, members of the community, members of the committee came to me and said, this bill is up. We were really troubled with the previous testimony we had on the record about how these funds have been spent. What's help us come up with a creative solution. Um, it wasn't, there's no sort of ulterior motive of whatever other than um, trying to get creative to get us to be better and move from the status quo of um, how things have been going because we we can do better. It's not just about the number of acres that we can point to. It's about the actual um, <laughs> being true to the fact that every single Minnesotan who pays property tax or who pays sales tax, um, these are their funds. And uh, as I said, uh, this is about habitat. Um, and I would, I would encourage folks um, before uh, sort of pushing back to at least make sure you've looked at the language. Um, and, you know, I guess it was, it was uh, strategically, if I had been super strategic, I guess I could have called it a different thing. I didn't realize how confusing it was. Uh, again, had I known that this was going to be an agenda item, I would have um, sent you all the language. Uh, so you could have looked at it ahead of time. And so, um, you know, th this is about habitat. It's just about who is doing the work in the habitat um, protection work. And, um, you know, I guess if, if it's the will of the council that the status quo is fine, then that's, that's, that's the will of the council. But uh, that, that's what's happening here is that um, I'm uh, trying to do the best in my dual roles as a member of this council and a member of the legislature uh, to make sure that uh, we are serving all Minnesotans with this fund and that um, we are being responsive when we get, uh, when the public is saying, you know what, um, I'm really troubled by the lack of, uh, you know, <laughs> there essentially is no response as to what's being been done um, to make sure that equity is part of the, the equation other than 
you know, the applications out there and anybody can apply. Well, we, we've got to push harder and we got to, we got to do better. And, and, and that, that's what this is. Um, it's about habitat. Uh, if again, if if you'd looked at the amendment, you would you would see that. Hey, Jamie, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yeah, let me go to Jamie and then Scott and then you, Tom. Um, Tom said his his hand up for a long time. Tom, can you can you jump in here? Okay, go ahead. I didn't see it until after the others. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that. Uh, uh, that uh, Dudley's Dudley's new member and uh, he and I are both rep, uh, not representing, but we're both from Northern Minnesota. And I, I, I'm not. I wouldn't say anything about what he just said because I agree with it all. So um, that's number one. Number two is uh, I, I'm a little worried here, of course, about the process. Uh, you know, uh, about as an an agenda or non agenda item that. Uh, that we're we're spending this amount of time talking about this, um, I guess we should be if if it's going to go through the legislature. But but uh, it isn't exactly what I would call a good process. I, I was in the legislature for 14 years, so uh, like Mark, I have some idea what's going on here. And and the last thing is, and and I. Uh, it isn't anything new, but you know we're talking to some extent when when uh, we're looking for new money and new places about uh, uh, supplanting. And uh, um, again, with good process, maybe I, I think that that can be uh, uh, be explained away too, which is fine. But like to see more. Uh, a little more uh, discussion and process on this. I realize the legislature doesn't necessarily like to wait for its uh, its volunteer organizations to uh, uh, to get it done, but I, I really would appreciate that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Can I go? Sorry down? if I missed you earlier, Jamie. Now go ahead. Right. I'm, I'm happy to hear that Senator Dibble thinks it's important to defend the process. I mean, that's why we're having this hour long conversation on this very topic. And of course, this council understands that the legislature makes the decision. Bottom line, this sets a new precedent that undermines the integrity of the council. And I think that's that's what you're hearing. And that's that's why we're having this discussion. And I and I do absolutely welcome that challenge uh, Representative Becker Finn brought forward to take a fresh approach to equity, equal opportunity, and inclusion. I, I think that's important. And, but this backdoor approach is not the way to do it. So let's let's give this council that opportunity and and, and have that be part of the discussions that we're going to be having going forward. Thank you. Great, Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, so the points I was going to make were uh, kind of a variation on Tom Saxhog and uh, and uh, the previous Jamie. <laughs> I'm getting my Jamie's mixed up here. Uh, comments. Um, uh, number one, um, you know, to, just to reiterate my points um, from earlier. Um, if it's good for Lassard Sam's, it's good for all the legacy funds, as well as LCSM, LCCMR. And I never have seen a crabby column from Dennis Anderson or any of these groups that get these billions of dollars over these past you know, 15 years or so um, when, when those funds are, are redirected um, by the legislature for blatant supplanting purposes. Um, um, uh, I, I'm glad to hear uh, that Jamie Swenson um, wants to this council to rise to the challenge of examining who gets to sit at this table and direct these dollars and get these dollars to make sure that we're serving all Minnesotans um, for whom these dollars are intended and frankly, who are all paying the sales tax. Um, I would disagree slightly with the characterization that this is a backdoor. Representative Jamie Becker Finn offered her amendment in the full light of day in a public hearing uh, with public testimony uh, in 
the process by which these funds are actually appropriated and spent for which I will remind everyone, the people who are elected and are held accountable for how these dollars are spent, the process by which they're elected to, to do that. Um, so I think um, we have various shades of, of agreement here, um, but I'll find, I will finish my comments by saying, and you know, it'll be maybe a little uh, sharp um, and impolitic, but I have to say to Tom Saxhog's point, we're spending an hour on something that wasn't on the agenda that to me feels like an ambush of Representative Becker Finn. And to the extent that this was planned, I am extremely disappointed because it seems like a lot of people were really ready with their guns uh, a blazing uh, to go after Representative Becker Finn without giving her any forewarning. This is a worthwhile discussion to have, but it's worthwhile to have in a planned and thoughtful manner. So we've now used up the time we were going to spend on elections. So I'm gonna sort of close this off here, but I, I would say, Scott, um, you know, if there was a planned ambush, your chair wasn't aware of it. Uh, um, and this is something that came up last week. So there wasn't, I think it was last week, maybe it was this week. So there really wasn't time to even get it on the agenda if we had wanted to. I think the discussion um, is great. I think we should have this discussion. Um, you know, the legislature is going to do what the legislature is going to do. Uh, um, you know, I would hope we'd have this discussion as we're talking about projects as part of our process instead of uh, after we've ended our process. But that's just my personal position. And, and Jamie Beckerfin knows, you know, I mean, I, I was board chair of child of uh, uh, Child Children and Nature Network, which is sort of behind this whole type of program. Uh, so I, I'm very interested in, in doing it. I, I haven't decided whether or not in my own head um, how this is proposed uh, makes sense for these funds. Um, I understand both sides of the argument and, and I would, in, would hope as we go forward, we'd continue to have the discussion about how to best serve all communities in Minnesota. Um, I think it's important that we do that, uh, um, irregardless of how this particular debate works out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move us back into the regular agenda. Um, thank you all for the discussion and the feedback. Um, I think it's, it's appropriate to have that. Um, you have in your packet a, a proposed calendar. Um, if the governor's appointees had been made, uh, we would finalize it today. Uh, um, but since uh, um, there are two members that are undecided um, at this point, being Jamie Swenson and myself, um, we may or may not be with you the next meeting. So we will uh, um, hold off approving the, the calendar until the final appointments are made so that whoever the appointments are, um, uh, we're doing as good a job as possible to uh, include everybody. Um, next on the agenda is the technical amendment correcting availability of ML 2020 appropriation uh, conservation partners legacy grant. Uh, Mark, do you want to take this? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Chair, regarding the calendar, just if any members have any problems with dates on the current calendar, if they could just alert staff, and we will take that into consideration. Um, and Mr. Chair and members, uh, item number eight on the agenda is a uh, technical correction. Basically, um, uh, there was a technical, cor or there was a, a mistake in last year's in the Minnesota laws of 2020 appropriation for CPL. And in your, in your uh, materials was a memo to that effect. And basically that appropriation at that time said that the appropriation will be available until June 30th of 2023. It really should have said 2024. So that's the technical correction that staff is asking your permission to recommend for, um, for changing to the legislature. So that's our request is that we can work with legislative staff to try to make that technical correction to the appropriation. And are you looking for a formal motion from us for to that effect? Yes, Mr. Chair. 
Great. Any discussion? Is there a motion uh, to allow staff to work with the legislature to correct this? So moved, Mr. Oversight. Chair. Great. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in uh, roll call vote, Amanda. Beginning with number one on our alphabetical list today, Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Becker Finn. I believe Becker Finn has left the meeting for her other meeting. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. I think he's left. I'll come back around to him. He He's still here, but maybe not still here. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Representative Heinzman. It seems that he's not here. So we've got one, two, three. Ten ayes, two absent. All right, motion passes. Thank you all. Um, Mark, uh, acquisition of parcels with existing partial state or federal ownership. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, members, uh, agenda number nine item is a uh, an item that will take at least nine positive votes of the nine affirmative votes of the council to allow it to, to for approval. And what this is, is um, it's a, a little bit of a formal thing right now, but um, within our procedures, if there's a parcel that a uh, organization wishes a purchase that has any type of pre existing protection on it. So it could have a sliver of rim easement on it or something. They have to actually ask for permission from the council to uh, go ahead and, and acquire that. Uh, generally, the council has asked them uh, always, I believe the council has said, we don't want to purchase with outdoor heritage funds. So either it's it, that portion of protection is uh, protect the land is portion is purchased with other than outdoor heritage funds or it's donated. Um, in this case, we have Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited and Minnesota Land Trust coming to us. There are actually um, six parcels. Two are, are requested by Pheasants Forever, one by Ducks Unlimited and two by Minnesota Land Trust. And these are uh, spread out between five different appropriations. So they're asking to amend these parcels to their uh, acquisition lists, they, it may be that they won't be purchased, but they feel that there's a good possibility that they might be able to acquire them. And um, as I said, this is a, a formality that has to come in front of the council. So staff has reviewed the uh, parcels and um, is recommending approval. What we would be asking for is a motion that the acquisition to present um, of the presented parcels uh, be approved by the council for acquisition. And there also is a list that was uploaded for you that shows where the parcels are, the appropriation they go to, the uh, all of the different data within those parcels. Great. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Any discussion? Questions for Mark or any of the staff on any of the parcels? If not, Amanda, will you call the roll? Beginning with number two, Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is absent. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Holston. Aye. 
Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Still appears to be absent. 10 ayes, two absent. Motion passes with the required nine plus votes. So thank you all. Um, next is uh, COVID related extension requests. As I mentioned earlier, there is uh, uh, one additional request. I'm not sure which one it is, but Mark was going to prepare a, a verbal report on that. And, and we actually request to the legislature that they extend these uh, uh, appropriations. Um, these are all COVID related. Um, one of my questions to staff and, and to you is, do we wanna actually go through the process of looking at all of these one at a time or do we wanna just give a blanket one year, recommend a blanket one year extension to everybody uh, that brings to staff a, a COVID related request? And, and I throw it out as a question, um, not as a, uh, anything other than that to, to the council as to how you really wanna see this handled. Uh, but I would like Mark to verbally add whatever it is needs to be added. Sure. Mr. Chair, thank you. And members, um, I would suggest that we go through these, um, we won't have to take a lot of time on them unless you wish to go into questions on individual uh, requests so far that are, in the, that are listed in item number 10. But, uh, I would suggest that we look at entertaining motions to um, forward or to uh, uh, recommend an extension on these current ones that are listed. I can give you that verbal one as well, which could be done also. And then the discussion of, of whether we have a, uh, a blanket extension for most appropriately would be Minnesota laws of 2018 or re re request to the legislature to consider that. Um, I think that would probably be the approach I, I would suggest that we go forward with at this point. Okay. Please go ahead. All right. So members, on item number 10, that we actually uploaded for you individually memos for each of these individual requests for extension. So you can look at the, the information that was provided by the program managers. Staff has looked at all this and, and um, for this is for 10A, 10B, C, D, E, and F. <laughs> so it actually ends up being five different memos um, and a lot of information, but each one of the appropriation project managers have really laid out nicely um, their rationale and, and the evidence that this is COVID related. Um, the staff is convinced of that as well, that each of these have been delayed by um, things way beyond their control, which have really been directly related to COVID restrictions. And it could be anything from getting a crew out there to do the work to getting an agency person out to do the permitting or the, the site inspection so that they can go ahead with the next stage of work. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's just kind of one of those things that has happened this year. Um, uh, some of these are one-year requests, some are two-year requests. Um, but uh, staff, I think, is, is pretty content that each one of them is appropriate. And um, I should mention, I'll just go through them quickly. And each, each one of the bottoms of the memos, it's, it gives you the kind of the history of their appropriations, too, and how their spending has been. So none of these are really out of line. Um, the, uh, the, Minnesota, or the uh, Minnesota Land Trust for 10A is, is requesting a single one-year extension. 10B is the Northern Waters Land Trust. They work with Minnesota Land, Minnesota, Minnesota Land Trust as well, but it's for a two-year extension for them. And of course, those are very much in the easement range as well as enhancements. So um, just getting together with people has, with landowners has been terribly tough for them in these, this last year, especially, and slowed things down tremendously. Um, 10C is the Minnesota Land Trust again, they're working with the conservation fund on this one and, and it is asking only for a single year extension. 
uh, 10D is actually from Minnesota Land Trust one more time with a different appropriation where they work with Hennepin County and um, in Hennepin County and they're asking for a two year extension on that. And then the final E and F are presented by um, the uh, Minnesota Trot Unlimited and it's E and F because there are two appropriations involved there. And they're asking for a two year appropriation on the Minnesota laws of 16 appropriation because that'll give them enough time to finish those dollars and get them spent. And then a one year appropriation on 17 because they yoke so closely with the 2016 dollars in the projects that they're, they're um, working on. And of course there's more details in each of the memos, but again, I just uh, stress the point that staff has has, has spent quite some time with the program managers and, and listening to the rationale. The last one is a, a strictly, it's not in writing because I just got it a couple of days ago, uh, earlier this week, and it was from Bob McGilvery of the Trust for Public Lands. Um, he asked, is there any chance that we can get in for a one year extension or will there be a blanket extension potentially for Minnesota laws of 2018? They have the, uh, the Trust for Public Lands works with the Mississippi Headwaters Board on that Mississippi Headwaters Board appropriation of, of uh, ML18. And they're asking for a one year extension on that. And I, I talked to Bob even this morning. He said that they have just not been able to, to um, make any, uh, they've not been able to deal with appropriately the um, uh, repercussions of the COVID-19 delays. And uh, of course that's within especially their easements and their uh, fee title acquisitions. And those easements and fee title acquisitions up there are all county board approved. And many of those lands, those um, uh, any fee, fee acquired lands are going to the, um, generally to the county, sometimes to DNR, but generally the county. So it's a real collaborative up there. Um, and Bob is asking for one more year on that ML 18 for Minnesota or for the uh, Mississippi Headwaters Board appropriation. Mr. Chair, um, at least we have the in the memos for A through F, um, the requested language for the, the motions and the requested links of those extensions. Um, I would suggest or, or in, ask that the council entertain uh, making those motions and approving them as written. And then we can deal with uh, discussion on the Mississippi headwaters separately or within the um, uh, conversation of a, of a blanket ML18 suggestion for extension to the legislature. Okay, um, so the uh, suggestion is that we approve the, the uh, extensions uh, that were uh, specifically outlined as a package, uh, A through E in your agenda. And then we'll talk, then, then we'll talk about uh, the Trust for Public Land and then potentially a blanket extension. Is there a motion that I can get on the table? Um, so I move, Mr. I Chair, you're suggesting that we take the, the walk-on piece separately. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with wrapping it into the main motion or we can. Uh, your motion, you can do what you want. All right, so um, so Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll move that we grant the extensions if that's the proper language for the motion for items 10A through F um, and then add the, the verbal report from Mr. Johnson for TPL. A through E or A through F, since we only have an A through E. Oh, I thought, uh, I see a 10 E and F. <laughs> uh, sorry, um, you are absolutely right. I was too far down the agenda. So your, recommend, your motion is that we approve A through F and TPL's one year extension request. Yes, Mr. Chair with appropriate language to be drafted by staff. Yes, Mr. Chair. Great, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, just one question, Mr. Chair, is there any detrimental effect by extending any of these? And that may be a center 
question from Mark Johnson uh, just prior to, and then I, if I will, I'll second Senator Dibble's motion. Uh, Mark, I'll just tell you, if we don't approve them, we basically will get the money back once the appropriation expires that they can't spend and then we'll have to reappropriate and it'll take another year to get it out anyhow. So we really, I don't, from my perspective, um, the smart thing to do is give them another year to, to spend the money versus starting over to get it out in the field because the projects aren't bad. And in most cases, these projects have spent a significant part of the money. They just can't spend it all. But Mark, do you have any? Maybe I should clarify a little bit. I, I, I understood that detrimental effect by not doing it. But is there anything that happens by extending this out uh, that we maybe should be aware of? prior to voting on this? Mark? Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, good question. The, the only thing that I can really think of is, well, two things that, that I can think of. Um, number one, that the monies, if there are unspent monies, they won't be reverted back to the fund as quickly. Um, on the other side of it is that um, there are a number of projects within these or applications of the money that would not potentially be finished. In some cases, it could be restoration or enhancement activity, but generally it would be otherwise acquisitions that uh, for, for um, uh, easements or so on that have where they are 80% through and they just, just need the extra time to get that, the final paperwork done with the landowner. And there are instances of those that I have been aware of for sure. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Any other questions, comments? Amanda, will you call the roll? Mr. Chair, members, beginning with number four, Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is absent. Representative Heinzman. Also still absent. 10 ayes, two absent. Motion passes, thank you. So do we wanna discuss recommending a blanket um, extension for COVID related reasons? Mark, do you have a, a thought on this? Yeah, actually, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to, um, Sandy deals so intimately with each of these project managers that I'd like, to, and she did do the memo, which also brought up that um, suggestion or that possibility. So if you wouldn't mind, we could have some comments from Sandy on this issue oh, as well. Oh, please. Um, the, the way that the, the COVID extension was written in last year's appropriation bill was more specific to the other legacy funds because we have multiple ending dates. So it, it didn't give our projects the extension that would have been helpful for our managers. Um, but I can anticipate based on you know the 19 requests that we've gotten um, that a blanket extension, you know, for an additional year for all activities under ML 18, you know, would be helpful. And those programs, um, the ML 16 and 17 programs that need extensions, I believe were already individually handled and are in the bill or will be put in the bill based on decisions at this meeting. So Sandy would like us to make a blanket recommendation to extend ML 18 by a year for COVID related purposes as she's working with our project managers. Is that, did I paraphrase that correctly, Sandy? Correct. Yeah, correct. Um, is anyone willing to make that motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, I'll, I'll make the motion and then I'll, I'll ask a question at the same time if I can. You can. 
Uh, Sandy, in the, of the A through F uh, extension requests we've received, if we do a blanket extension, and this is maybe just a clarification of, again, what we're voting on, does this blanket extension apply to all projects that were uh, uh, in the process of being, you know, start to finish? Does this blanket extension apply to all of them at that point in time, or do they still need to go through the application process? Um, well, the way the language was written in last year's bill is project managers had to make a request to get the blanket extension that was in law, and we could definitely write it to be that way too, so that there is some sort of justification for the extension on record, rather than just saying everybody gets a year. So if you're more comfortable with that, we can uh, write that into our language. Uh, thank you, Sandy, Mr. Chair. I, I, I guess then the thought process I would have is that uh, I, I would appreciate that because at the end of the day, the projects that probably or maybe possibly are not asking for an extension were maybe not affected so much by COVID. And I think, it, you know, keeping that, that completion date to as soon as possible <laughs> would be a good thing. So uh, right. that, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. But uh, again, I'll make the motion. So your motion is with that modified language. Great. Any discussion on the motion? Amanda? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I believe Senator Dibble has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that, Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to quickly support Senator Lang's notion only because that also allows us, I mean, it creates a little bit of red tape um, and some time in terms of you know writing the request and the application, but it just, I think, creates some, some better mechanisms for both our staff as well as the council to keep track of who's, who's asking for extensions and why. Great. Even Thank though you. they're gonna get it pro forma. Yeah. Any other comments that I missed? Mark. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, I appreciate those comments from Senator Dibble and Lang. As from staff's perspective, the way it was written in the last blanket, um, as Sandy had alluded to, worked really well. Um, it was easy for the project managers to contact us and request that, and it all it all worked very nicely. So, I concur. Great. Now, Amanda. Beginning with number five, this time around, Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is absent. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Heinzman, aye. Heinzman votes aye. 11 ayes, one absent. Great, motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll go to 11A through E, as Scott is so, you know, has made me realize um, uh, instead of through F. So Mark, do you wanna take this? Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, and members, this is actually divided into just two presentations and two memos. Um, the first is just 11A and then the remainder of them all come under 11 B, C, D and E are on the second memo. Um, the, uh, the first one as they're queuing up, uh, Jamie Byer, who is the administrator for the Boys to Sioux Watershed, will have him present um, their rationale for asking for this request. These two, or these, uh, this item number 11 um, for all of these extension requests are not COVID related necessarily. I'm sure there are some COVID influences there, but primarily they're not COVID related. The other thing is that each of these 
um, or at least within these two requests, one from the Boys de Sioux and the other one from the Wild Rice Watershed District. Um, within each of them, there has been a previous extension request that has been approved by the council and approved in law. Um, so this is a second request and that's a little bit precedent setting. Uh, and, it's, and that's why staff wanted to bring them separately to the council um, because it's, it's different than asking for the first request. And I think because of that, there has to be a, a little more questioning that happens. And so the council gets a chance to really review the rationale and say, okay, we think this is still a good project. We think you've got a, 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 a opportunity for success or is there some bigger problems that you see? So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, this first would be a, a second request extension um, by the, uh, for the Mastinka River Fish and Wildlife Habitat Corridor Appropriation from Minnesota laws, uh, actually it was previously extended in Minnesota laws of 2018. It's a, I think a 2016 appropriation. And with that, I think we have Jamie Byer who will give us some testimony. Hi all, sorry I've been I've been watching on the YouTube channel and there must be a little bit of a delay so I'm just catching up <laughs> to the introduction. Sorry chair and, and council members. So as you read in your packet we're before you today to request an extension for the award given to the Red Path Impoundment. The Red Path Impoundment was started about a decade ago and both myself and I've got my engineer here Chad Ingalls, we both came on after the award from Lazard Sams and after the project had been proposed and in some ways um, designed to a certain extent. But this is a very large, complicated project. It's three square miles. It's five miles of river channel. And so um, it, it's been pretty complicated to try to get all the land put together. And um, we recently, last year under COVID, doing online virtual land closings, we're able to acquire all the land necessary. And we did that willingly from voluntary landowners, but that was, that was a huge milestone for us. And since then we've been, well, in addition to acquiring the land, but aggressively finishing the design plans, we've been working very closely with our DNR to make sure that our project proposal meets, meets their permitting requirements and, um, it hasn't been a lack for working on this project. We've invested um, millions of dollars in moving this project forward. We haven't stopped at any point developing this project. We just haven't been able to quite get all the pieces together to access our award yet. And I'm, I'm open to questions and so is my engineer, Chad Ingalls here too. I can't hear anything. I'm I'm sorry. I Chad, are you able to hear? No. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I think for some reason you're not coming through. Can you try that again, test? You're not hearing me. We can barely hear you. No, it's no, very no, light. Lean into the computer a little more. Hear me now? Uh, Ron, take over. I'm going to sign out and sign back in. There you go. Mr. Chair. Back. Yes? You just came back full strength. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for saving me from that. Um, are there questions for Jamie? I guess the question is what assurance can you give us if we give you an, an extension? that you won't come back again. I mean, this is money that other people could have spent long ago. Um, I'm concerned both with the precedent of a second extension and the fact that it's just money tied up that could be going in the ground somewhere else. So can you address that for us? 
Sure. So our, our engineering plans are 95% done now and we, we can't finish them until um, we finish the permitting with, with all the other agencies and that should happen this year. But, but through that work, we have phased out the project and um, each phase is very doable. Uh, we've got a, a number of partners lined up for each. You know, it's, it's complicated because each funding partner, some funding partners won't fund the flood mitigation. Some aren't interested in habitat. Some are the opposite. And so we're trying to phase this project to meet all of those needs. And um, we're actually going to get started. The Boys to Sioux has some work that they can do ahead of, ahead of um, some of the other construction. And so we're going to get that started this year. So groundbreaking will happen. And uh, we're all very excited about this project. It was just really complicated to get it all put together when you have landowners involved. Chad, would you, would I be able to pass that along to Chad too to add? Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Chad Ingalls. I'm the district engineer for the Boyd Sioux uh, Watershed District. Yeah, the Boyd Sioux is um, very serious about this project. $12 million have been spent to date uh, developing this project. Um, the majority of those funds have been spent on the acquisition of, of land. Um, approximately four square miles, four square miles of corn and soybean ground have been acquired uh, from uh, landowners, farmers uh, for the project. So obviously, um, I, I think that's quite remarkable um, in my uh, history of doing uh, flood risk reduction projects. And that land was required without eminent domain. It was all voluntary sales and it took a very long time and the board was committed to that. And that's the biggest reason for the length of the duration. Admittedly, and the board apologizes, the initial application was asked for too early. Um, the initial funding from Lassard Sams was asked for too early. It just simply took longer to acquire the lands um, under the guise of we're not gonna do eminent domain uh, than originally estimated. But we are there now, $12 million has been spent. Um, the final uh, uh, engineer's report um, is complete. It's in final permitting right now. Um, and we intend to dedicate uh, this year um, to putting um, funding together for the phases of the project and to start construction uh, in 2022. And, and maybe questions? Chad, we should, sorry. We, we might Other need questions to... or comments from the council? Is there a desire to do anything? Uh, Scott. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, just a, a quick question. Um, so uh, let me just say at the outset, um, you know, these kinds of projects are, are very attractive um, to me. Uh, because of the multiple benefits, you know, um, you know, water quality, flood mitigation, habitat. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, there's nothing not to love. Um, but, uh, but I did take notice when I was reading through the board packet, uh, some of the skepticism, um, or you know, not skepticism, but just questions that were raised by our, our board chairs and, and wondering about um, the readiness when, when this was originally identified as a worthy project to allocate funds to. Um, can, can you tell me a little bit more specifically about the decision to not acquire the lands through eminent domain or condemnation? Um, number one, why? I mean, it may be self-evident, but I think it's important to hear why um, for the record. And B, um, is there any downside to not proceeding that way? Um, have any landowners refused? And so, you know, we may have a project that's not as contiguous as, as we would have hoped or be um, in going through the negotiation process. Um, I'm certainly familiar in other uh, places for other kinds of projects of public benefit. Um, going through the negotiation process means a premium gets paid that would otherwise um, not be warranted. So has it caused the project to be more expensive than it would have otherwise needed to be? Please respond. Jamie, did you wanna take that or I, I sure can? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board, um, the reason 
why the boy to sue uh, was not um, willing to utilize uh, condemnation, uh, eminent domain uh, to advance the project faster was because they have a long-term uh, strategy uh, for the boy to sue watershed district. Um, the Red Path project is just one of many uh, flood risk reduction uh, impoundments and environmental enhancement uh, projects that it has planned over the next uh, many decades. And so it's important for them to maintain their relationship uh, with area landowners because lands will, significant lands will be required in the future as they continue to develop uh, projects. And they do not want to destroy uh, any, any relationships that they have with the public. Uh, many of the landowners uh, where land is acquired uh, own quite a bit of land in other areas and will need to come back and knock on their door once again uh, for, for other projects in the future. And so that was uh, the primary reason. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Mark's my question, yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Has it caused um, property being acquired for prices that are higher than what, have other, what would, would otherwise not have been and or prices that weren't really warranted? So uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board, um, obviously the properties were acquired over a very long duration of time. And from the beginning to the end, um, the board utilized uh, appraisers. And obviously project uh, properties that were acquired were 10 years ago were appraised at um, significantly lower values than the most recent purchases uh, that were acquired just in, you know, the recent, in the past year. So I, yeah, I understand, you know, slowing it down causes it to be more expensive, but specific, specific to the negotiations, um, were there, was there any um, significant upward departure from what a land would be appraised or valued at? In individual cases? No. All right, thank you. Mark? Mr. Chair, since it was brought up, um, Chad, could you please, you mentioned that these were corn and soybean grounds, could you mention the farming aspect as it moves forward? And, and part of that being why you have good uh, uptake with the local landowners? Uh, sure. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the, of the board, uh, is it possible for us to do a screen share on our end? I think uh, in answering that question, if I could, if we could do a visual um, I have uh, one of my engineers uh, here, James Guler, and if he would be able to share a screen, we could kind of show you a visual of kind of the layout, uh, of, of, and then you can see the agricultural fields and kind of how everything comes together that way. If not, then we'll just do our best to describe it. Okay, there it is. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a three-dimensional uh, model of the uh, the Mastinka River uh, habitat uh, corridor and the Red Path impoundment. And really they're, I under, they're, they're two separate projects, but they also work together uh, in tandem. Um, the Mastinka River uh, today is known as Judicial Ditch 14. Uh, like so many um, uh, rivers and in, in parks of our state, uh, a century ago, um, the Mastinka River was straightened by a, 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 a straight uh, trapezoidal channel um, that basically cut straight east and west. And uh, that project began at State Highway 9 near Norcross and basically goes all the way to Lake Traverse. And so if you could uh, pan out, Jim, uh, what this project does is that uh, it creates a, a new um, naturalized uh, river channel. Uh, it's two-stage. There's a low flow meandering channel for what we call two-year uh, bank flow, normal flows and then as well as a, a, flood, a floodplain channel. Um, at the upstream end, there's a, uh, there's a structure that will split flood flows from uh, regular uh, everyday river flows. Everyday river flows will, be, uh, will move down the bypass corridor and along the outside of the impoundment. Flood flows will be pushed into the impoundment. The bypass corridor consists of five and a half miles of uh, naturalized uh, uh, river channel uh, rehabilitation. 
uh, that will consist of native grasses and it's approximately 300 feet wide. There's access every mile. This will be open to public hunting, fishing, and recreation. And um, so today, um, these lands that uh, were purchased are currently farmed. Those lands, of course, will be taken out of production. Inside the impoundment, um, and this is the part of the project that you're not funding, but in, inside of the impoundment, you see very large agricultural fields. Um, those become the, uh, the inundation area for, for spring floods. And if we have very heavy uh, summer flood events, that's where the water is stored, the excess water that's pulled off of the Mistinka River and that area you see there. That will continue to be farmed um, in the future. Um, the Boyd of Sioux owns that property and will be rented out. Of course, uh, those, those rental contracts are under the uh, guise of there is a risk that uh, flooding could happen in the summer if, if needed. Um, so yeah, so those are the egg lands and then the egg lands that are being taken out of uh, production. I'm not sure that I answered the specifics, specifics of the question though, if you could remind me if there's something I didn't address, let me know. <laughs> Chad, that this is Mark again, and that's that does answer my question. The only other thing you didn't uh, mention about is the public access for hunting and fishing on the corridor. Yes, so along uh, the project, um, is, this part of the world's very square. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the squares on there, those all represent uh, one section of land. And of course, so we got roads that are exactly one mile apart. So at every mile, there's going to be access uh, to um, this uh, public area. And again, uh, we think it'll get a lot of use from um, hunters, fishermen, et cetera. There's a, there's a walleye migration uh, up from Lake Traverse, up the Mistinka River. Very close to here is the North Ottawa Impoundment. That's a huge attraction uh, for waterfall. In the fall, Jim, perhaps if, I don't know if our model is big enough here just to kind of zoom out on where the location of North Ottawa is. If not, that's fine, but um, North Ottawa is just located up just a few miles uh, yeah, to the uh, north. And so it's, it's kind of neat that we're building on two, rec you know, two recreational areas that are kind of in proximity. Um, it'll, it'll just bring more people and more use uh, to the area. The Mistinka River is currently in a severe state of erosion uh, because it's a straightened channel. And so one of the uh, significant environmental uh, elements of this project is the fact that um, it'll, it'll uh, significantly reduce the erosion and sediment that's being carried to Lake Traverse. And so uh, this, uh, this uh, habitat corridor, the sinuosity of the, of the meandering low flow channel that you see um, was designed for stability. Um, we've got pools in there and so forth for fish to utilize. Um, the blue areas that you see, um, those are going to be wetland uh, recreations. Those are for mitigation for the uh, Red Path project. You're not being asked to fund a piece of those. Um, what the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Funds, how those will be used specifically is to pay for the excavation, the shaping of this, of this uh, river uh, corridor and to help with the seeding of it. The, the earthen material excavated from the corridor will be used to construct the levees adjacent to it but that hauling and construction of the levees will be paid for others, those others being folks interested in flood damage reduction. Are there any additional questions? Does anyone care to make a motion to approve the extension? Mr. Chair, I'll move it. All right, Mark, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, Amanda, will you call the roll? Mr. Chair, members, beginning with number six, Eggerling. Aye. <coughs> Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Representative Heinzman, could you repeat your vote?
We'll come back round to him. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Beckerfin is absent. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Heinzman votes no. Heinzman votes no. 10 ayes, one no, one absent. Motion passes, thank you. Mark, you wanna handle the B through E? Yes, Mr. Chair, and well, Amanda, you can start queuing up Kevin. Um, so Kevin Root is the program manager for the Wild Rice uh, Watershed District. This is actually four different appropriations uh, which they are asking for extensions for. Three of them are phases of the Wild Rice River corridor habitat restoration. The fourth one is actually the second one down in the list on their, on their memo. It's for Minnesota laws of 17 for the Goose, Goose Prairie uh, appropriation in which they're working with DNR for doing restoration activities on those, restoration and enhancement activities on the Goose Prairie WMA uh, lands. Um, so let's see, with that, we have Kevin Rood who's available. And uh, again, this is one where there, there was an extension to the phase uh, one, I believe it was, of the wild rice corridor habitat restoration. That was uh, extended in 2018. And um, uh, now they're asking for a second extension to that. And then they're asking for the first extensions to their phase two and phase three of this, uh, this appropriation. So. Mr. Chair, I'll let you take it to hand to Kevin, if you'd like. Kevin, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, the reason that we're asking for the second extension is, is due to the process and problems we ran with the process of starting out with NRCS, not working, now working with Bowser. So currently in phase one, we have $2.27 million that we have spent just about a million dollars of it and acquired over 300 acres of land. And in the applicants that we have in the hopper right now, we have a total, including what we've already received, $3.3 million coming up. And it's just, we don't know if we can, with the way government works, I don't think we can get it done by June 30th. So our, our goal is to just get an extension to give us time to use that up. So then along the same breath, then we would be looking at uh, phase two of this process. Uh, that would be our first request for an extension there just to be safe. And that would take care of the lower wild rice. So did Mr. Chair and members, did you want me to discuss the Goose Prairie also, which is the 2017? Please do. Um, that one, um, it's been a, a slow process working through uh, land acquisition and also securing funding. But we did just now uh, from the flood hazard mitigation with the Minnesota DNR, we just were approved for the final 400,000. So now we have funding that will take care of the whole process for us to finish it. And so we can't get it done by the end of 2022. Um, our goal is to start construction this year, but we know that it's gonna take more than June 30th of 2022. And that's a first request for an extension. And with that, if there's any questions. Members. Any discussion? or questions. Scott, are you saying something? I see you 
moving your lips, but don't hear anything. Talking to someone in the console here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Trying to look at all these little boxes is so much fun. So what's the, uh, uh, anyone want to make a motion or? Well, Mr. Chair, I, if I could. Yes, please. Um, I, I didn't see uh, I didn't see any notes in the in the report from from you and and uh, Mr. Shara, um, but um, like the last one. But um, what do you have any general feelings or observations? Um, I, I think you thought that maybe the last one wasn't quite ready for prime time when we entered into that particular project. Many years later, it probably is now a little more ripe. Um, is this a, kind of a standard issue extension because of land acquisition pro problems or or do we have kind of the same degree? I, you concern? know, if you're asking my opinion, yeah. uh, um, you know, I, I'm concerned with a second extension um, for obvious reasons, uh, but uh, um, I would probably be inclined uh, with the, uh, uh, the request for uh, ML 17 and 19 that expire in June 30th of 2022, um, not to expend, extend to 2024, but to 2023 and tell them to get the work done. Um, you know, we're still talking a lot of time. Uh, um, it, it's, and I would, would take the, uh, the, the uh, ML 2020 and it's already till 2023. I think it's premature to extend it to 2024. Um, so my recommendation, if you're asking for one, would be to extend the ML 15 uh, as requested uh, 17 and 19 uh, for for one year to 2023 to give them time to do the restoration and get on with it uh, and not to take any action on the 2020 because it's just too early. And I think Ron, when Ron and I talked about this, this was sort of, we were in, in alignment on that. And Ron, tell me if I'm misquoting you. No, you're not. Uh, yeah, we did talk about it. Uh, just made uh, sense to me as well as you to approve uh, the initial request, but uh, uh, hold our hold our powder dry for down the road. Uh, so, you know, some of these projects are much more uh, complicated than I, most of us uh, possibly even know. Um, on the other hand, um, sometimes you have to light a fire under. Uh, people to get some things done and and maybe this will do it that way so i'm on board Tom? Mr. Chair? yeah uh so per your per your recommendations and uh, the vice chair's recommendations i would move the, those recommendations on those four particular uh okay items thank you uh, is there any discussion? Amanda, um, will you call the roll? Mr. Chair, members, beginning with number seven, Representative Heinzman. Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Did you get that aye? Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Yes. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Yes. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Yes. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Becker Finn is absent. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. 
Eggerling. Aye. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Aye. Heinzman votes aye. 11 ayes, one absent. Motion passes. Thank you, Kevin, for your work. Thank you. Appreciate it. I can't tell you, members, how much I look forward to seeing you all in person and not having to go through roll call votes like this. <laughs> <laughs> there are two reasons I really want to see you in person. One, I just would like to, and second, I would like to just speed up our process uh, for things, but hopefully that's in our future before too long. Um, uh, the uh, last thing on the agenda is, is a discussion on the uh, updated February forecast. Um, uh, just to recap uh, the, the forecast, and, and Mark will recap probably better than I, but the forecast uh, increased the, uh, uh, the funds that were uh, going to be attributed to uh, our account so that uh, there would be roughly $4 million of additional money um, over what we looked at in December. Um, Ron and I spent some time and, and I just put a plug in for Ron. You know, it is absolutely great to have a vice chair who you don't agree with all the time, but you work really well with and uh, you look for solutions. And on this, we agree completely. Uh, um, um, we talked about uh, what do we do, and, and you know we could uh, easily uh, um, do one of three things. Uh, we could divide up the money and individually allocate, which this council hasn't taken a shine to in the past. Uh, um, we could spread or spread it around to uh, uh, a little bit to each project based on a percentage. Um, or we could do uh, nothing um, and allocate it uh, uh, in the upcoming grant cycle. Um, and uh, given that there are uh, three new members uh, on the council uh, and it's a relatively small amount of money, um, Ron and my uh, uh, recommendation to you uh, is that we fully fund uh, the CPL program, which is a, essentially a, a regrant program, uh, um, and not fund them with more than what they've requested, but, but fund them uh, with what they've requested and, uh, um, and hold the rest uh, for our, our uh, process, which we'll go through next summer and fall. Uh, for reallocation rather than try to figure out how to reallocate. Um, there, it's not, if we spread it out, it's gonna be very difficult to make a difference. Um, and it just, it felt like it made more sense to give this new council the opportunity. And you may have five new members ultimately uh, um, with this money. Uh, um, we felt it made more sense to just wait on the majority of the funds uh, rather than, than allocate them in any particular way right now. But that's our recommendation to you. We throw it open to you for discussion um, as to what you wanna do, because it is up to this group, not the, the two of us. Uh, and Ashley, I recognize you, but Mark, do you wanna say anything before I go to Ashley? Uh, Mr. Chair, just one thing quickly, and that is that the council last December, last November and December had decided to keep a 10% reserve available because of the uncertain times, economic times that we're in with regards to COVID. Um, this, uh, there was a, uh, a sheet that was prepared by House Fiscal and MMB. And basically that uh, gives you an idea of, uh, from a 10% standpoint down here, you get a chance to see what the current appropriation or recommendations for appropriation that are in the bill, how that all worked out, and then what it would be, what's available underneath the new forecast. Um, so the main thing is to let you realize that um, the, uh, we would be maintaining at least a 10% reserve again moving forward under, under any uh, scenario going forward here. 
So, Ashley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question about what what the dollar amount would end up looking like for each project um, if it was spread across. Um, not saying that's my preference. I'm, I'm just curious if you could give an example. Well, there are two ways to spread the dollars. One would be to just divide by the number of projects and the other would be to do a percentage. So if someone was getting an allocation of a million dollars versus $5 million, they, everybody would receive the same additional percent, which is, if we're going to do it, I think what Ron and I would recommend. And that is 2% um, mark. Am I right? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that's right. It comes up to be about, if it was just across the board, the same percentage, it would be about um, uh, 90,000 more per appropriation. So a relatively small amount. Other questions or comments or thoughts? Is someone willing to recommend a motion based on Ron's my recommendation? Can I Scott? just ask? I, I I apologize for being ignorant, and I should know the answer to this question. But um, the uh, uh, Conservation Partners Legacy Grant Program, uh, statewide Metro Habitat Phase Eight. Um, just get, someone give me like just one sentence, what, who, who they are and what they do, or who that is, what, what that program is? Um, I can try. Essentially, this council takes proposals uh, in excess of $400,000 and makes direct recommendations on it. The CPL program is a small grants program administered by the DNR for projects under 400000 and we essentially recommend an allocation to that program. Uh, the DNR runs it and they don't have to come back through us for, for, uh, for approval of each project. Um, it's divided between Metro and outstate to ensure that there is, is uh, funding going to the Metro area. Since a lot of our funding uh, legitimate goes to outstate, we're in the habitat business. Uh, we wanted to make sure there was a, a metro focus with, with some part of those funds. Um, there is also a expedited process for uh, proposals under $50,000 for work being done on property owned by various levels of government. Uh, you would, this is uh, restoration dollars uh, for stream bank erosion, for uh, buckthorn removal, for a multitude of, of uh, small projects. Um, and that those grants are approved much faster by the DNR than the uh, expedited process which opens up for uh, uh, requests two or three times a year, depending on the level of funding. Does that help, Scott? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, and so, yeah, adding 590,000 to something like that would make sense, um, but adding the tiny amounts, spreading it across all the existing programs, um, I agree with the analysis, probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And so deferring the, the balance of those dollars to the upcoming round, um, I would support. Um, and then I just wanna say, um, uh, I believe in prudent reserves. Um, and uh, I was glad to hear about upping the reserve level from five to 10%. Um, but I hope um, we're coming around the corner here or to the end of the tunnel or whatever, and we can get back to um, uh, the more traditional reserve level because uh, I'm a critic of excessive reserves because I believe you know public dollars should be out on the street doing public good. So, but that's a, for a future conversation. Yeah, and I, I don't think you're gonna find disagreement. There was just so much uncertainty and to some degree still is till we're through the COVID crisis. That the, the thing we absolutely don't wanna do is have money appropriated and then not have money available because you've gotta go back through the legislature to take money away, which is a really ugly process. Um, so 
Jamie and then Tom. Yeah. Jamie and then Tom. I was going to make a motion, so if Tom has a question, go ahead. No, that's good, Jamie. Take it away. Okay. Um, thank you for the uh, the additional uh, uh, discussion on the recommendation. I know Chair Hartwell and Vice Chair Sheriff sure put some some thought and time into this. So I would like to make a motion to add the five hundred and ninety thousand to the CPL program to fully fund it, and then also to leave the balance in the accounts so the council new council members um, can go through the full alloc allocation process in the next round. Great. And Tom, you were going to do the same thing, correct? All right. Any other discussion? So we're making a recommendation to the legislature to modify our the the bill that that uh, we gave them as a draft. Essentially, we we don't get to do this. We're recommending it to the legislature, and typically the legislature has looked to us for these types of recommendations. Uh, um, and they've been very cooperative uh, in terms of, of um, taking seriously what comes out of this commission as, as, uh, or this council as recommendations. And thank you, Senator Lang, for the work you've done in that in the past. Any other discussion? Amanda? Mr. Chair, members, beginning with number eight, Holston. Aye. Holston votes aye. Senator Lang. Aye. Lang votes aye. Peters. Yes. Peters votes aye. Saxhog. Aye. Saxhog votes aye. Swenson. Aye. Swenson votes aye. Hartwell. Aye. Hartwell votes aye. Shara. Aye. Shara votes aye. Representative Becker Finn absent. Senator Dibble. Aye. Dibble votes aye. Edmondson. Aye. Edmondson votes aye. Eggerling. Eggerling. Eggerling votes aye. Representative Heinzman. Heinzman aye. Heinzman votes aye. 11 ayes, one absent. Great, motion passes and, and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ron, for working with me on that. Uh, um, for those of you that are new, um, we, we do this voting and, and rather than have the voting order be uh, so that one person has to always vote first and one last, uh, we rotate it around the, the council uh, that's why Amanda is saying, and starting with number six or starting with number one, um, just so that it, it isn't uh, uh, always that one person has to declare first. Um, and that was something we established as a practice uh, a while back, and we've just continued. So if you were wondering why we were doing it that way, that's what it was. Um, uh, I, can, I think I can speak for the new members, Mr. Chair. We figured it out. I, I, I'm sure you did, but I just wanted to be clear, you know, the education process continues. Um, so with that, uh, there were no public comments uh, submitted uh, um, in advance. So we have no public comments uh, to report out. Uh, if there's anything that anyone would like to discuss as a council, um, we have a few minutes or I'll let you go early. Mark? Yeah, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to come back to one thing, if I may, and that is that I know the council has had a rather vigorous discussion early on with regards to the amendment in the House for the No Child Left Behind. Um, and I think it's fairly safe, at least from my perspective, to say that the council wishes that proposal to come back through the process which would be the normal RFP process in the spring um, that, and, and of course works through this next year. And the council also, um, at least my recollection is the council also conveyed that the message um, last fall, I believe it was at the December meeting, it may have been the November meeting um, when, we were, when it was discussed. The, um, uh, the 
the thing I'd like to point out is that I know that Rep or that Senator um, Rood, who is the chair of the Legacy Committee in the Senate, will be asking um, if there is an amendment that is that comes forth in the um, in the Senate. She'll be definitely asking what is the council's thought on this, and I think Senator Lang can can forward that. But I, I am also asked, and even if there is no amendment in the Senate. When it comes to conference committee, I will be asked, uh, what is the feeling of the council? Um, so with that, I just wanted to kind of verify that. And then also, um, I am Representative Becker Finn mentioned about a previous, um, it was a legacy committee meeting where the discussion of the equity, equitability of dispersion of funds to BIPOC or underserved communities that discussion came up and I provided a, an extremely inadequate um, uh, answer to that. And I apologize for that. I did to those, to those uh, committee members also afterwards and sent an email through the, the uh, committee administrator to each of them um, saying what we have done and, and many more of the things that are happening with regards to equitable distribution. There was another committee meeting also that asked for where they looked at just the distribution. And I gave uh, probably again, uh, an incorrect uh, assumption or maybe it was actually it was that one where we presented and, and I showed the distribution across the state and the distribution of where the council members come from. I was looking at, you know, I was looking at distribution from a population standpoint and from a geographic standpoint and not so much from a, a racial standpoint, but I think that's what the legislators were looking for. So I wanted to apologize to the council for my inadequacy in those answers, because I think that really led to, or at least inflamed toward the Outdoor Heritage Council, this um, uh, feeling by some representatives that uh, the funds are not dispersed equitably. Um, one of the things I discussed with them was that we don't have conservation groups that are um, like a Hispanic conservation group or a Hmong conservation group or, or whatever um, with, that are led by different um, uh, racial profiles or well, that's not the right word, let racial groups. And because of that, um, you know, the council, Council does act on all the presentations that come before us. And we reach out, we try to reach out to everybody by publishing the RFP. And I've actually you know, met with many groups. We do have tribes and bands and tribal authorities who are involved with us with CPL grants and with um, I have been recipients of large grants in the past. And I tried to convey all that information to the legislature, to the house at least. And um, again, my message did not come across properly, evidently, or at least, uh, or maybe people just did not read the information that I sent to them. But my apology for that uh, inadequacy, and, and I think that led somewhat to this inflammation. And, the, and lastly, Mr. Chair, I'd like to say in this whole discussion, there's an opportunity for uh, back when I go back to when I think back to the uh, fall meeting or the early early winter meeting in November, December, I believe, when we talked about the same issue of the No Child Left Inside and the potential funding. Um, member McNamara, uh, Danny McNamara was a member at the time, and also Senator Tomasoni was a member at the time. Each of them were on the LCCMR, and they made an offer at that time to work with um, the interested parties in the house and other places to go to bring the issue before LCCMR for potential LCCMR funding. There's an opportunity that this council has, and it's actually in law that the council may make recommendations to the LCCMR and the other funds with the use of their funds. And I don't think the council has ever really done a formal recommendation, but it may be that this is one of those opportunities or the council could make that formal recommendation to LCCMR to consider the No Child Left in, Inside from the aspect that this could be really good for Minnesota's habitat future and uh, bringing people into this, into the culture of, of enhancing and keeping, protecting our habitats. 
That said, uh, there might also be a way that within a grants system that some outdoor heritage funds could be constitutionally utilized if they were utilized for the actual supplies, the seeds, the seedlings, those actual, you know, habitat tools that, um, and, or the prescribed burn expenses or things like that, that are used within however it goes forward. Um, I don't think we're at an, at an end of thought about this. And that's what I've heard from the rest of you also, is that you're all eager to, for the council to consider other, other ideas. Um, it's just doing it through the process. And a recommendation to LCCMR is one of those potential process tools we have at our hands. So Mr. Chair, I just bring all that forward to you. Well, thank you for bringing it forward. I, I, you know, to me, this is something we need to talk about more. We, we need to figure out how we're relevant to everybody. Uh, um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to, as long as I'm chair, uh, ensure that we have those discussions going forward in, in our agendas. Um, uh, and I think it would be helpful for this council to, to do a deeper dive on, you know, the, the steps the council staff has taken and steps that it might take um, to address this issue. Uh, I would also say, uh, um, the, uh, uh, one of the ways to accomplish what Jamie Becker Finn is proposing uh, is to encourage our existing groups uh, to uh, uh, partner uh, in these types of projects uh, uh, to get the, the work done with volunteer labor and, and training um, instead of having the proposal uh, that she made to directly fund them. Uh, um, which I think would alleviate many of the fears and, and concerns that were raised. Um, whatever we decide to do, we need to make sure that, that we're doing it with seriousness and deliberateness uh, to ensure that we're doing the best we can to benefit habitat and the whole population of the state. Uh, and I don't think anyone would disagree with that as, as a goal how we do it is gonna be an interesting discussion. We won't resolve this today and we won't resolve this tomorrow, but we can continue to work on it. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I certainly encourage us to do that. Tom? You have gotta get off mute, Tom. How's that? Good. All right. It might be uh, because it was quite a few years ago. It, it might be worth revisiting. Uh, one other thing that was that was done. And this just happened to be where the sovereign nations uh, up north uh, is 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 talk about how we have transferred and 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 financed funds so that both both the Fond du Lac and uh, and the um, uh, White Earth Band uh, were both able to purchase lands with our with funds that we granted to them. Now, I, I, I don't even want to go into it, but it's something that that we probably ought to review because because it was pretty significant, and uh, um, it's probably something that hasn't been done a lot around the country. So, just an example of of what we're talking about here. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, uh, Mark was asking us um, what should he say if the legislator, legislative committee asks him uh, what the council, where the council stands on that amendment. Um, I don't know if we answered him uh, or uh, what he, what we expect him to say. Dudley? 
Yeah, I, I just want to say I, I totally agree with what Mark had to say. I think those are excellent recommendations to, to you know, move the um, recommendation on to a, a funding body that is better equipped to, to, to do the work. Because um, unfortunately, the habitat we have in the state just happens to be in rural, you know, primarily in, in rural parts of the state where predominantly white people live and that there's no way we can really change that. Uh, but if, you know, if possible to fund habitat restoration in and around urban areas, you know, that's something we can do. Or like Mark said, we can buy seeds and, 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 and things like that to, you know, restore habitat and, and have, you know, volunteers of color doing all of those kinds of things. So I think basically what I'm saying is the suggestions that everybody that, that David, you and, and Mark have thrown out to me make way more sense than funding an education program. I just can't, I just can't with good conscience do that knowing what uh, the funds were intended, what the taxpayers intended the funds to, to be used for. Okay, Scott. You're on mute still. Sorry, that old thing. Um, I just wanna understand what we're doing right now. Um, has Mr. Johnson placed uh, an action item in front of this group? Um, because I, I think he's you know, asking I'm for- I'm very uncomfortable and I'm really uncomfortable doing that without Representative Becker Finn being present. Yeah, he, he's asking what he wants us to have him represent as a view on behalf of the council, I believe. Right, sounds like he's packing an agenda item on in this discussion period, looking for some sort of formalized direction or motion or you know, some sense of the council in some other forum or format. Um, right. That is not something I sh we should be tacking on to the end of this meeting, uh, giving staff direction, um, particularly without the subject of the conversation She's presenting a bill right now. I'm texting with her, um, and so she can't jump back in. Sure. To have a, a full, free, and fair discussion. Fair enough, Senator Lang. Yeah, I I, I agree with Scott on that. When I if we want to add an agenda item, and this is I, I apologize earlier for for coming in late. I had a town hall meeting this morning, so uh, I didn't catch a whole lot of the discussion that was around it. So. I, I, could, I guess what I would do right now is just speak as to the Senate position uh, myself. So, and this is probably news to all of you and it'll probably be published Monday, but the bill is going to be heard next week, uh, Wednesday, one o'clock and Senator Roots committee. I don't know if uh, Mr. Johnson has, has gotten that notification yet, but uh, I just found out yesterday. Um, so hopefully you can get those amendments ready that we uh, passed off the committee today. I, I do believe if this is something that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to have the discussion, I, I can tell you uh, with the utmost certainty that it won't be in the Senate bill. Um, from a personal standpoint, you know, when I first was uh, <laughs> uh, appointed to the committee, um, I, I almost immediately got a visit in my office from Bob Lassard. And I can tell you that the meeting uh, consisted of a couple of things, but one of them was he wanted to make sure that I, well, <laughs> that I was worthy of the position, I think. Uh, and, and the next thing was that he in, instilled in me uh, the, the intent of the committee uh, and, and honestly, the integrity of the committee. The committee has the utmost respect of both bodies, I believe. Uh, I, I truly think that any recommendation that comes from the, the committee and the, the hard work that this committee does on a year-round basis uh, that comes to the legislature deserves that respect. Um, with understanding where Beck, uh, Representative Beck Finn is coming from and honestly kind of supporting it in the, in, in the long run, I don't think this is the proper format. Um, if the council decides that it wants to hear proposals like that in the future, uh, so be it. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, but uh, I, I do agree with Senator Dibble that we should probably, if we're going to have a discussion, we'll, we'll make the point and we'll go from there. And I will go back and watch the discussion that happened this morning. So 
Thank you. I'm going to recommend that we not give Mark what he's looking for, which is a, a position, but have him represent that the council has talked about this issue. Um, there is um, interest in the issue, but the proposal itself, there is a, a uh, not uh, a, a council position, but, but concern and support coming from council members at, at different levels. And, and uh, um, unless we schedule a specific time to talk about and make a recommendation that he can't provide one, he can only give the context of our discussion. With Mr. not, Chair. is that okay with everyone? Mr. Chair? Yep. I guess I would frame that slightly different. Um, the council had extensive discussion over the amendment this morning uh, and quite frankly, last December. Um, we just voted on a recommendation that does not include that. So the, the action, if you read the minutes of today um, in front of the legislature, it would basically be the legislative recommendation was our last vote. That's our recommendation. We took extensive comments amongst ourselves um, and didn't include it. It's not, it's not passive, it's not aggressive. It's just a, a statement of a fact of what our recommendation is. All right, Kristen and then Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, could I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. Um, I would just like to echo what, what Mark just said. Um, I think our vote stands for what our position is. Okay, Scott. Um, thank you, I was basically gonna say the same thing. I mean, Mr. Johnson, I don't think you should spend any time um, discussing the No Child Left Inside proposal. Um, the uh, legacy funds and their recommending groups um, advance. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just like, uh, you know, in the legislature are, you know, um, in the Senate, you know, our, our bills are supposed to speak for themselves. I mean, you know, we fill up a lot of space and time and air uh, talking about a lot of sidebar issues. But, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the council has a, has a recommendation, you know, and I don't think you should get drawn into a much more discussion than that. Because, frankly, the No Child Left Inside piece is on the other side of the fence, it's on the legislative side of the fence. The council has made its recommendation in the form of you know, the, the bill that's being presented. But uh, I, I would just also revisit uh, my disappointment that you're raising this kind of discussion at the very end of a meeting with the principal not present, asking for instruction um, and, and, a, and a council action with no prior public notice either. Mark. Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senator Dibble, thank you for that direction. And I, I must say that I, I was not trying to, I, I apologize if it appeared that I was trying to bring an appropriate, in, an inappropriate um, request for action by the council. Really, I was looking for clarity as to where to move forward. And I think you very well put it just now that, uh, as well as Senator Lang and, and you others stating that the council has made, um, there is a message in the action the council has already taken. And I, I don't have to address the no child left inside. It's, uh, uh, you know, other than if people wanna know, the council had great discussion on it and, uh, and I can leave it at that. I thank you for that information. I really, I do also thank you for bringing up earlier about the inappropriateness of the potential of uh, asking for an action when uh, Representative Beckerfin was not here. That wasn't my intent. I really was just looking for um, some guidance. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. 
I think you've got your guidance. Is there anything else anybody wants to bring up before I adjourn us? Thank you all for your attention and participation today and, and look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person before too long. I adjourn the meeting. <laughs>